Thanks for joining us for the primary candidate forum for the candidates seeking to run for Maine 2nd Congressional District. My name is Carol Conley and I'm the Executive Director of the Christian Civic League, our 501c4, and the Christian Education League, our 501c3. The League's been around since 1897, executing our mission of bringing a biblical perspective to public policy. Our vision for Maine is to see it become a state where God is honored, religious freedom flourishes, families thrive, and life is cherished. I'm very thankful all three of the candidates seeking the CD2 seat are committed to that vision. How blessed we are to have three candidates who have elected will defend life, religious freedom, and parental rights. There have been a lot of ads, a lot of literature, and other activities in this campaign. Our goal through this forum is to let Maine's pro-life, pro-family citizens get to know these candidates so each of us can make an informed and prayerful decision on July 14th. Each of our candidates has been given the questions ahead of time, and for fairness sake, we're going to adhere to a strict time frame for each question. I will hold up a yellow piece of paper to let the candidates know when they have 30 seconds to finish. Thanks, Carol. And to all the candidates, thanks for participating. Tell us who you are and why you want to serve in Congressional District 2. And we'd like you to focus on what role your personal faith would play in your service. Well, I am Dale Crafts, and I live in Lisbon Falls my whole life. Um, businessman, I uh, come from a business family. I'm fortunate to have uh, six children and uh, 14 grandchildren, which is the thing that I'm most proud of. And there's a little more story to that, but we'll get into that now. And uh, so I've uh, been a public servant. Uh, I served uh, way back. I told him I was with Governor LePage when he was out helping the campaign. I told him, I said, you know, I want a landslide. And he chuckled, what was that? I said, well, I was at the town meeting floor, and they, somebody uh, nominated me to be on the budget advisory committee, and nobody wanted it, and I got a unanimous vote. He got a chuckle out of that. So that's where I started my public service. Um, in, in politics, and then went on to get elected to uh, the uh, Lisbon Town Council, served there a uh, three-year term, and then went on to get elected, and as Carol mentioned, in 2008, served four terms in the legislature, and had the uh, privilege of, uh, for six years, um, co-chair in the Legislative Prayer Caucus with Senator David Burns, which was uh, a highlight of serving up there. And Mike, you know, you, you know, he was part of that because Carol, he was there every week and, and what a time we had. So the importance of praying. So that was really a important part, praying and nonpartisan. You know, we tried to do it in a way that uh, we just wanted to bring people in from both sides and to uh, pray over what we did as a servant uh, to the main people. And so I really believe that is, um, you know, we shouldn't be called politicians. I wish the word would be more a servant you know, being a Christian and growing up in church and learning the word of God, you know, we're taught that. And uh, so I, I, uh, I like this verse, uh, Samuel 12, 24, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, but consider how great things he hath done for you. And uh, so that's why I want to serve. Well, first of all, let me say thank you both for having me. It's uh, Carol and Mike. It's, it's great to, uh, it's been great to work with you all these years, and it's great to speak with you today. I'm Eric Brakey. I am running for Congress to represent the people of the second district of Maine uh, in Washington, D.C., and I'm running for a simple reason. I'm running because I believe in a free Maine and a free America. I'm running because I believe that those God-given uh, rights that we have to life, to liberty, to the pursuit of happiness, I think that that's, that's the mission of America, protecting those things, protecting life protecting liberty, protecting just our, our basic rights to make our own choices and to, to live our lives as we see fit under, under, um, uh, under the religious beliefs that we have. And uh, that's what I've, I've fought to uphold in Augusta. That's what I'm going to fight to uphold in Washington, D.C. You know, when I ran for state Senate in 2014, I was a real underdog candidate. Frankly, nobody thought I had a chance. I was running in a Democrat-leaning district against a Democrat incumbent who'd been in elected office for 36 years. And frankly, the political establishment that frankly didn't care for me very much, uh, they, uh, they thought it was cute that I would try. I was 26 years old. I'd never run for office before. I had no chance against this, uh, this, this big government anti-life incumbent Democrat, or so they thought. But I went out there and I knocked on 8,000 doors. I talked directly with Maine people about how we can solve our problems, not with more government, but with more freedom, giving people back control over their own lives. 
And in that race, they said I couldn't win. We ended up winning in an 18 point landslide. It shocked the system. And then when I got to Augusta, I had the real pleasure to work with, with uh, folks like Mike McClellan, folks, folks like Carol Conley. Of course, Mike, you were in the, in the House of Representatives at the time. Actually, part of your district overlapped with my district, and I really appreciated when I was running for that, you were one of the individuals who believed in me and endorsed me when a lot of the party establishment had written me off. Uh, and Carol, it was such a pleasure to work with you when I was chairing the Health and Human Services Committee. You know, I remember fights that we had to, to protect Maine people against the, 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 these pushes for physician-assisted suicide. I remember working with you very closely on that, Carol. And I remember just thinking, you know, uh, in, this, in this healthcare system we have where so much is controlled and dictated by, by uh, not by the patients, but by government bureaucrats, by insurance company bureaucrats, you know, perhaps well-motivated, but this physician-assisted suicide push wasn't putting choice and power in the hands of patients to decide what to do with their own lives. It's putting power in the hands of faraway third-party bureaucrats to decide who lives and who dies. And that seemed a, a very dangerous, a dangerous reality. And I'm, I'm, I'm sad to see that uh, since, um, since I left the Senate that that was pushed through. But um, it, was, it was my pleasure to represent the people of Androscoggin County. People know me best for my, uh, my signature accomplishments, passing constitutional carry to restore our Second Amendment rights, passing welfare reform so that um, our tax dollars are not being used anymore to buy things like alcohol, cigarettes, and lottery tickets, and passing right to try legislation, really pro-life legislation, giving people back their ability to, uh, if you have a terminal illness, your right to try medications that could save your life uh, that have not yet been approved by the FDA. We passed that in, in, in Maine. I was proud to lead the charge for that. Got it into the Republican national platform even. And then our president, Donald Trump, took that and made it a signature issue for, for himself. And now it's federal law. I look forward to representing the people of Maine 2nd Congressional District to fight for a free Maine and a free America, just as I did in Augusta. I'm ready to take that fight to Washington, D.C., and I'd love to earn your vote. Absolutely. Well, Carol and Mike, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for having all of the candidates so our faith community can get to know each of us individually, personally, professionally, and how faith plays a role in our daily lives. Um, I am running because I, I do believe that this is an election of our lifetimes. And I've said this time and time again on the campaign trail, I truly believe that our constitutional rights are under attack, our religious liberties are at stake, and our very culture, our faith in God is being challenged. And so we need somebody who is going to fight in Washington every step of the way to protect and defend each of these constitutional rights and religious liberties that we have today. And so I, I believe that we have far too many career politicians in Washington and we need more representation of the people. And I believe that, um, you know, again, it's, it's um, a point in time that is very, very pivotal. We need a fighter who has a skill set, who has the life experience and the professional background to work in a tough environment day in and day out. And uh, I believe that the American dream is under attack. Um, I have um, a, a very strong belief that the American dream is alive should we continue to empower people to reach their potential. And we have not been uh, doing that um, as well as we can be. And I came from absolutely nothing in my background. I grew up on welfare. I grew up in a shack with no indoor plumbing until I was about 10 years old. And, uh, you know, uh, coming from a uh, lack of resources and uh, poverty, uh, you see the world a little bit differently. And um, so I want to be that fighter for people to let you know that um, you can reach success with the right support. And as long as you have um, that right support behind you. I, I also, um, you, you mentioned, Mike, how does faith, you know, uh, how is faith going to play a role? And before any big decision, I pray. And, uh, you know, it's... Um, uh, I have shared this story um, with some folks, and it, it's been um, kind of new on the campaign trail to 
to really speak out about my faith, but it was in my 30s when I had um, my my calling to God again. I went to Sunday school, I went to Christian school in eighth grade, but there was a period of time in my 20s where I lost faith. And so in my 30s, um, I reached out again to God. I was in a Bangor church, actually, and uh, I was attending a funeral service. And the pastor asked, is there anybody ready to accept your Lord and Savior today? And um, I was sitting by myself and I at that moment knew that I needed to let all fear, intimidation go. And that's when I accepted God uh, for the second time in my life. And it's made a profound difference. I'm in my forties now, you know, that was some 10 years ago. Um, and before any decision, you know, I do pray and I put my faith in God that he was going to give me the guidance that I need to make good decisions. And we need to send, again, more people to Washington who have strong morals, integrity, principles, and who are going to stand with their faith in God proudly and um, make sure that they are, you know, on that right path and making good decisions for the people in the best interest of Mainers. Um, and, and in fact, that's all Mainers. You know, one of the great issues that concerns the Christian Civic League is the abortion rights issue and the desire of some people to fund abortions through public monies. What could the folks of congressional, uh, the second congressional district expect of you regarding the life issue? Well, I am 100% pro-life. I've been an advocate for it. You know, I served in the legislature in Carolina. I'm sure you guys both remember the LD 1457 which is an act of strength and consent, parental consent. You know, that was, uh, I did gave a, I gave a passionate uh, plea on the floor. Um, all I could think about is my own, my own daughters. And, uh, and uh, I just could never imagine that somebody would, a child could go and get an abortion without even their parents knowing it. And, uh, and that was, that was very disturbing and is. And so, you know, I am, uh, I believe in uh, life at conception, um, I, I scripturally. As we know, Jeremiah 1.5 tells us in uh, Psalms 139. And, uh, and I support the heartbeat bill as we see passing around the country. I think it uh, is a good place uh, for a lot of these states to be able to prove that life, you know, it's really simple to me. You know, if a heart's beating, it has to be life. So, you know, I don't know who can argue that. Now, people might want to argue at conception, but how can you argue when you can have a heartbeat in, in as little as uh, 20 days of conception? So I am a strong pro-life person and will always uh, uh, do that. I always will always vote against any public financing of Planned Parenthood. Uh, people that are believers shouldn't have their money uh, going towards abortion when they don't, when they think it's a uh, taking of life. First, Carol, as you know, I have a 100% pro-life voting record. Uh, I believe that when it is the mission of our, of our American government to protect life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, life is the first one for a reason. And I think that just like we today look back at some of the terrible, atrocious sins committed by past generations, and we wonder how was that ever allowed in America? How did, was it ever allowed in America that one person was allowed to own another person? I think that future generations are gonna look back at us today and wonder how we tolerated the mass genocide taking place in abortion clinics across America. Millions of innocent babies being killed. And yet, because it happens behind closed doors, we put it out of mind and we pretend that it's not happening. But I think that we do have an obligation. I think that a just government is, is, is a government that not just respects life, but that actively defends it for both the born and the unborn. And so that's why I have a 100% pro-life voting record. That's why when I ran for U.S. Senate two years ago, I was endorsed by the National Right to Life. It's why in the Maine Senate, I sponsored legislation to tr block taxpayer dollars from going to abortion providers. And I was the lead Senate co-sponsor on legislation to require parental consent for abortions conducted on minors, you know, people, children. Um, I, in fact, I, I always went back to a story of, of someone shared with me, a good friend shared with me of a time when she was a young teenager and in, a, in, an adult individual had gotten her pregnant and took her to get an abortion. Her parents never knew about it. This person had statutorily raped her. And uh, with the abortion, not only was the, the, the baby killed, 
but uh, all evidence of his crime was wiped away. With a parental consent law, that man who, who abused her, who took advantage of her, would have been brought to justice. And instead, both the baby was murdered and, um, and the man who abused her never faced any consequences. So I'm gonna be a consistent voice for life in Washington, just like I was in Augusta. I believe in the right to life and I believe it should be defended. Hands down, I will fight to defund Planned Parenthood from day one. I do not, I am adamant, I do not agree that taxpayer dollars should be going toward the funding of abortions. I do not believe in abortions. It's a very personal story to me. And it is one uh, that is near and dear to my heart. I had my daughter at 20 years old. She is not um, anything other than a gift from God. And she is my miracle. She's my proudest accomplishment. Um, that's a contrast to my mother when she was 20 years old. She decided to have an abortion at 20 years old. And her second child, she decided to give up for adoption. Her third child is me, and she decided to raise me. So it, I do feel, and I'm very passionate about this, that I am a miracle as well uh, as my daughter. So it's a very, very personal and emotional issue for me. And I look forward to being an advocate, a very strong one in Congress, who's going to fight for the sanctity of life every step of the way. So we've seen nationally private businesses, schools, and individuals of faith being accused of discrimination for refusing to participate in the redefinition of marriage of gender. How would you approach legislation like the Fairness Act and other forces that are eroding our First Amendment rights? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, gender identity should never be a special uh, protected category on the law. We were protected by the Constitution already. Constitution makes it very clear. Um, and also the Federal uh, Civil Rights Act back in 1964, for example, bias discrimination based on race, color, national origin, and sex and religion. And I always wonder, I mean, how many categories of special rights are we gonna have and what's the next one? You know, uh, if we're all covered under the Constitution, uh, I don't think that we should be passing special right legislation. Uh, I think that the if we would just adhere to the uh, Constitution, uh, which I'm very concerned about, as you see in this nation, all the stuff that's going on, that people are not even, even when you, your, your Supreme Court justices are, are voting against the Constitution, as we saw recently with uh, the right to open up church, uh, that's very disturbing. So uh, I think the Constitution takes care of that, and that I, was, I, I would not vote for any of uh, the, the Fairness Act um, at all. Thank you, Mike. You know, it is worth understanding, I think everyone should understand that this document right here, our US Constitution, exists to protect our right to live our lives, to associate with who we want to associate, to practice our religion as we want to practice it. As long as we're not hurting other people, we have the right to make those choices for ourselves. We can make our own choices in our own church communities and, and uh, government has no right to come and tell us who we can associate with and what we have to believe. You know, the First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or bridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. So right in there, uh, we have the freedom of religion. And yet right now, of course, not only are we seeing people being you know, pushed around, we're see we've seen here in Maine that even our churches have been shut down by the government, uh, which is something that frankly, Churches should be able to decide for themselves with, uh, with the coronavirus, you know, what risk people are willing to take. But as I read the Constitution, the government has no authority to come into the church and tell the church that they have to shut down. Uh, and uh, so our, our freedom of religion has been absolutely under assault. Uh, at the same time, um, a part of the First Amendment is we, we, we have the right to, we have the absolute right to believe what we want to believe. We have the absolute right to, uh, to gather together with who we want to gather together with. And I very much believe the beauty of our American system is that when we disagree on these sorts of things, the only force we're supposed to be able to use against each other is the force of persuasion. If someone disagrees with uh, our perspective on, uh, on traditional marriage or, or, um, or, or, or gender, then these are things that we should be able to have conversations about, dialogue about, 
But instead, so many have been resorting to going to government and they're going to use the force of government to try to essentially control people's thoughts. That's not what America is about. Um, so I'm for, I'm for freedom across the board. I'm for our entire Bill of Rights. I'm for freedom of religion. I'm for getting the government to mind its own business. Absolutely. I think more than ever now we see our First Amendment rights under attack, um, but specifically as you know, you've uh, approached this question, um, in Congress I would oppose adding new protected classes. We need to take pause and we need to look at this issue very, very closely. Um, I will say this too though, a good friend gave me this. I, I'm not sure if you can see it, but well versed. Okay. <laughs> It, it's a wonderful book. It really is. It's biblical answers to today's tough um, issues, uh, many of them political, um, but it's something that I have looked to. And um, in terms of the Fairness Act, you know, um, I understand that these laws are concerned with the rights of the customer. But what about business owners? Look at what's going on today. Government shouldn't be telling owners who they can serve or restrict business owners from uh, exercising their own rights. I think that we have a very, very interesting precedent uh, going on right now with the government telling business owners that they can turn people away for not wearing a mask, okay? But yet there are laws that are telling businesses owners that they must bake a cake for a gay couple. Now there's a contradiction. And I think that the hypocrisy is starting to show. It's very, very clear now. And with President Trump at the helm and appointing conservative judges, I'm hopeful that the courts can see this new precedent to overturn those unconstitutional laws. We have three solid candidates that are vying for this second congressional seat. The Christian Civic League will enthusiastically endorse uh, whoever emerges from this primary. What differentiates you from the other candidates? In other words, why should our listeners vote for you? Well, I'll tell you, I have a lot of life experience, um, a lot in, in a lot of different areas. I always like that when I'm out here with Governor, Le, uh, former Governor Paul LePage, he makes it really simple. And he just says, people ask him all the time, well, why are you supporting Dale? He makes it simple life experience, legislative experience, and business experience. And um, so that's, that's really, you know, um, the biggest part of it. I mean, I have run businesses all my life. I've, I've uh, been served in the legislature for four terms, as we, we talked about earlier. Um, I served as the assistant pastor to my church for years. I did hospital visitation as, as, a, as a, you know, a counselor in hospitals and praying with people. I taught Sunday school for 15 years. I've, I've built houses, uh, run heavy equipment, you know, and I'll tell you, the business, the one thing that you uh, learn a, a, a lot about life is having six children. As we know, we have children, right? We know that, uh, that that'll teach you a lot of things. So I really have a tremendous amount of experience that my opponents, and, and not to be critical of them, they're both my friends. You know, Eric served two terms, I've served four. He has no business experience. I'm the only business person in the race. Not that it has to be always a business person, and I don't mean that, but um, there's just a lot of experience there. The other part that with Eric, he's more of a libertarian. I've been a lifelong Republican. When I registered in high school to vote, I registered as a Republican. My opponents have not been lifelong Republicans. And the other thing that with Eric, and not be critical, because this is his choice, but he's more of a libertarian, and the thing that um, really differs us is his foreign policy. Eric believes, and we had this conversation, a lengthy conversation when he was running for the Senate, he believes that every military base outside the U.S. borders should be closed down. And uh, I debated him uh, on this, and uh, he didn't deny it. And the thing with that is, if that would happen, I believe the world economy would collapse if America brought all its troops home. Russia and China, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, would raise their ugly head, and I'm afraid that Israel would be wiped off the face of the earth. So that is a big issue, a big one difference between Eric and I. Well, let me say, first of all, I've, I've always been someone who jumps in, gets my hands dirty, and gets, hand, gets very hands-on. I think that actually, this is what I learned, I think, when I was younger, growing up in the church, we would 
go on mission trips um, to different parts of the country, helping to build houses and helping to, you know, really help lift people up who've been struggling. And I think that's where I kind of learned a lot of these lessons of if you want to kind of get the job done, you got to be willing to jump in and do it yourself. And when I was in Augusta, I was wi wi widely recognized as a very hard worker. And not just a hard worker, but someone who was, who was able to get things done. When I was there in Augusta, Democrats controlled the House of Representatives. Republicans controlled the Senate. There wasn't a lot getting done because of partisan fighting. Uh, and yet, because I don't look at, I don't approach these things as a um, purely partisan politics. I, I don't look, look at things through that prism. I look at things through the prism of our Constitution and our basic fundamental liberties as, as main people and American people. And that's why I was able to build coalitions to restore our Second Amendment rights, to reform welfare, to pass right to try, uh, and, and to protect our religious freedoms. And that's exactly how I'm gonna approach things in Washington, DC. I will say what differentiates me from my opponents is that I'm a proven conservative champion who gets things done. I built a large record of accomplishment and, uh, and the message of a free man and a free America is resonating with people across the second district from Lewiston to Presque Isle. That's why we've got the strongest grassroots support. Our grassroots supporters have already been out there. They, before the coronavirus hit, they knocked on over 35,000 doors. And uh, since then, we've made over 40,000 phone calls. Uh, we've been able to bring in the, marshal the resources. We have more small donors uh, among Maine people than all my other opponents put together. We have the grassroots. We have the resources, we have the message that is needed to be able to win this November. And should uh, Maine Republicans select me as their nominee on July 14th, we are going to win this November because I've, we're gonna take the fight to Jared Golden, we're gonna fight for free Maine and free America, and uh, we're gonna defeat him, then we're gonna take that fight to Washington, D.C. Well, I grew up in rural Maine and I have a background that is very relatable to Mainers in the second district and many among our faith community. Um, I have worked very hard to get to where I am today and it wasn't easy. We all have struggles, we all have challenges and we have successes. And I want to be that advocate for everybody in the second district to let you know that we can have a more prosperous Maine. We can focus on our families, our faith and the policies that help us be a greater state. First and foremost, it's God. And then it is family for me. It is then state and country. And like I said earlier, it does, um, we are in a time right now where our constitutional rights, our religious liberties, and our culture, our faith in God is being challenged. So we wanna make sure that we are sending the best advocates to Washington, D.C. to make the right decisions for the people of Maine. How do I differentiate myself? Well, I have a lot of different experience and that includes media, communications, government experience, working with federal agencies and departments, state departments, and communications, working with media nationally and locally. And I've built a rapport with many of those reporters and journalists across our country and in our state. That's important because we need a messenger in Washington who can let people know what's going on and also to let you know what I'm doing every single day. We live in a time where we can be the most accessible and visible elected officials ever. And we need to make sure that that's happening. We know with Congressman Golden, it's not happening. He's disappeared. And we need somebody who is going to have a seat at the table and has that government knowledge again. I have worked with uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tom Price at the time when he came to Maine on the opioid crisis. I led a round table that Governor LePage appointed me to lead. And I also led in the governor's office's domestic violence awareness campaign. I have got the skill set, the background knowledge, the professional and personal experiences to help me excel in Washington, DC and fight for you. And that's exactly what I intend to do. Well, that ends our questions. We wanna thank the candidates uh, for being will willing to participate in this discussion. Now, Christian Civic League also is looking to the national election, which is set for November 3rd, 2020. We again will be putting together voter guide materials that will help you to know more about candidates in Maine and nationally, and as well to then participate by casting your vote. 
Materials will be created that will give you answers for the candidates uh, through their own survey responses or through their public record. This will be made available later this summer and help you to be more involved in the election cycle. If you want to be more involved in the election cycle, you can contact me, Mike, at 207-329-6148, or you can email me at policy at cclmaine.org. We encourage you to check out our website and also, also return to it often, and that's at cclmaine.org. We also obviously ask you to get involved and vote. God bless you all.